Why are you overdrafted if you have forty five hundred dollars in the savings? Well, it's high. Yeah, pretty high. She doesn't want to spend the savings money. That doesn't make sense. You've lost seven hundred fifty dollars this year. Personal finance is a fire for some Caleb Hammer audit videos. Now look, we found out the whole team is watching this. This yep. is like their guilty pleasure. You and I have not had that pleasure, so here we go. Brett, I am so excited because I love when there's good personal financial information out there to make the world a better place. And it sounds like Caleb is doing something exciting, so let's dive right in. Oh, what is this car? It's a 2021 Ford Mach-E GT. Ooh. It's actually my second that one. Sounds fancy. Second one? Dude, you're... 20. <laughs> what? I, I had a fully paid off one before. Oh, right? so we got to get it financed. Um, but uh, it just wasn't meeting what I needed to do, especially with the range and the amount of driving that I was doing. So I sold it and I bought the current car that I have paid off. And then I bought another car. Oh. What's the balance on this thing? I'm going to tell you the problem. On my new car? Yeah. Uh, sixty-four thousand dollars. Oh goodness! That's the for balance. Year old. See, sixty-four thousand dollars of car debt, bringing in three thousand dollars a month. That's his a income. Third of that being from using your car to bring in more income. Does not sound like wise finances, but what is the interest rate? Twelve percent. Oh. <gasps> See, that's <laughs> why. First of all, Caleb, how do you get these people to come on? And confess this. I mean, this guy knew that this was a bad decision. I mean, I was impressed he had a paid off car, a nice paid off car. Now, at 20, you probably shouldn't have a car that expensive, but at least it was paid off. But this decision making around like a $64,000 note on a $3,000 monthly income, that just doesn't compute. That doesn't even pass the common sense test. I, I, I'm holding a koozie here because we have what's called the money multiplier. <laughs> Not because money you start drinking after Moneyguy.com slash resources. We have what every dollar you have could become yep. based upon your age. So a 20-year-old, if you let that money grow, it at least has the opportunity to become $88. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine what $64,000 is? Multiplied by 88. I don't do public math. So it's I a big give, number. It's a big number. Not to mention the 12% interest. Absolutely zero chance he ever gets out of this situation making those type of decisions. Yeah, when it comes to buying a car, you can tell this guy's not following 23.8. If you want to know more about what that is, go to moneyguy.com. Check out our stuff to learn about 23.8 when it comes to buying a car. So what's the overall financial situation? What are we looking at today? Well, we have, and this isn't on that statement, we have about $20,000 in cash for our emergency fund. Okay. 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 It's interesting laid out about 10,000 of it is in Bitcoin and the other 10,000 is in <laughs> like, like, that's yield side and care. not an emergency. You have $10,000 in an emergency fund. <laughs> that's fair. Okay. And I have $10,000 of Bitcoin that I can also yes. use if I need to. That you should sell right now and put in your emergency fund. Go on. <laughs> and I was literally talking to my wife about that and I was like, I don't know. I don't know. But half of what's an emergency fund, I will immediately say that's stupid risk. We had $36,000 in our emergency fund. Yeah. And all of that money is gone. Where'd it go? It went to emergencies. What were the emergencies? We needed to remodel a bathroom. The, 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 it wasn't an emergency fund. <laughs> okay, there's several things here. First of all, this gentleman fell into the trap of access to cash yep. versus actually having cash. Because I, a lot of people, I've made that mistake. Yeah, sure. Um, with home equity lines and other things. And people, I, I've even had neighbors tell me that they think that their brokerage account, their investment account, counts as emergency funds. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, wait and try to go get access to that while the stock market's getting crushed, while the real estate market's getting beaten up, while you've lost mm -hmm. your job and the underwriters don't want to give you any money. That is not truly an emergency reserves. That is a disaster. The other thing, Bo, is do you consider renovating your house an emergency? Not, not even almost close. Not even almost close. If you're someone who's trying to do things like, oh, I'm going to upgrade my car. I'm going to upgrade my home. I'm going to make a voluntary decision with my dollars that does not fall into the emergency camp. Those about dollars are supposed to be there for job loss or an unexpected medical bill or a car accident where you have to get transportation. It is not for, oh, I just want to generally improve some part of my house. That's not what an emergency fund is for. Two, three jobs a week. And what do you think your oh, average oh, weekly no. your average monthly pay is? I think I'm about three thousand a month. Three thousand a month, okay. Is that before taxes or pre taxes? That's before. Okay. And then I'm assuming since these are contracting positions, you're setting money aside for taxes. I try. You try. Oh. 
okay. I, I don't, but I mean, it's <laughs> it's a good thought. Uh, so three thousand, and you're not setting like thirty percent aside. No. Ooh, ooh, okay. Oh goodness. How long goodness. has this contracting thing been your livelihood? I've been doing it for three years. And um, the last two years, how has that tax situation looked? Um, I haven't filed my taxes in three years. <laughs> Why? Um, uh, I, guess I mean, I just my heart's kind of, dropped. I've filed she extensions. I've talked to nice. my accountant. Um, she did. He's also not very happy with me, but okay. um, I just haven't done it. It's just something that's not really been on my list of priorities. I feel sad for her. <laughs> she didn't even. She was like not even not even realistic about what she's doing from a financial perspective. I, these things can get steep because realize that you're accruing like a five percent up until twenty five percent of the total outstanding liability mm-hmm. is building up. So she doesn't each year as she missed, she's going to have interest costs, mm-hmm. but she's also going to have a twenty five percent penalty for each from, year for uh, um, what's outstanding. That's scary. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is look financial building of wealth and and building independence is a journey, but I, I get so sad when I find out people are going, taking steps backwards and paying penalties and interest to the federal government is an absolute disaster because now not only, but to, to even start your journey of building wealth, you have to now make mm-hmm. them whole because realize your government, I'm not trying to be sensational about saying this, but they do have the guns. Sure. I mean, this is the people that can literally show up take your stuff and literally take you to jail. Just go ask Willie Nelson and, uh, and Wesley, Wesley Snipes, Snipes and all the other people who've, who've played stupid games and had st- and won stupid prizes from doing it. So she says she's an independent contractor. She's self-employed. She's a business owner. And while entrepreneurship and being a business owner can be a super exciting thing that can pay huge dividends, there are some additional responsibilities that come with that. One of those responsibilities being making sure that you're accounting for taxes throughout the year. Just yeah. because you're getting... You know, if you, if you get a W-2 income, there's naturally taxes withheld from that. Well, if you're getting paid as a contractor, if you have 1099 income coming in, if you're self-employed, the onus is on you to make sure that you're withholding so that when you do file your taxes or when it is time to make that estimated tax payment, you have that cash readily available. If you're not doing that and thinking through those processes, you're not operating your business the way that a smart business owner should. If we're paycheck to paycheck, we're not able to pay off a credit card. Are we in the right line of work? Are you doing what's responsible for you? Yeah, I'm. I mean, what I've do you mean? Do- you're losing thirty percent interest on a card you can't pay off, and you're uh, f- more than fifty percent of your take home is going to rent. Ooh. I think the way I look at my scenario is, I love what I do every day, and okay. I'm able to pay rent, and I'm able to pay for food. And you're not able to pay for food. That's incorrect. <laughs> That's incorrect. You're putting it all on debt. You cannot afford food. I'm able to get food. You're able to get food by using debt. You're not paying for it. You're using someone else's money. I mean, I haven't used that credit card in like, I think just once in the last like month. But if you can't pay off that credit card because you don't have enough money left in your checking account, then no, you cannot afford those things. Yeah. Um, You're only putting $40 towards it a month. See, I feel like a lot of people run this game. It's the shell game where what they want to do is they want to just see if they can kick the can as far down the road as possible. So that $2,000 credit card balance turns into the $4,000, and $4,000 turns into six, and six to eight, eight to ten, ten to until you finally start maxing out the credit cards. Well, then you go open up another credit card, and then you get on this vicious cycle where it is a hole that the more you dig, the deeper you go, the harder it's to get out of until the whole thing implodes upon itself. It just sounds like this guy that Caleb's talking to hasn't reached the bottom, but man, he is moving in the wrong direction. Well, I, I, it's not even digging a hole with a shovel. It's digging a hole with uh, the biggest ex- excavator that mm-hmm. you could find. And that's what, that's what I hate is because it's, it's a walk towards failure. Yep, I absolutely. mean, it, tro- it totally is. And that's what, look, good on him that he's passionate and feels good about what he's doing for a living, but somehow he got the discipline part wrong to live on less thing you make. If you can't get discipline, step one of all the ingredients that are needed for wealth building, you'll just never get out of that hole. I, I love that he said something so common sense. He said, well, hey, I'm, I'm able to eat. And Caleb said, no, 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 you're you're not able to put food on the table. The credit card company is putting food on the table, and you're going to have to pay that bill later. I think a lot of people don't realize that. So don't let yourself fall in the same trap as right. this guy. They're desperate to hire right now. If any, any industry is desperate to hire, it is service. And how long do you so- think I'm going to last there? What does that mean? Like, in terms of get fired, or are you existing? Yeah, until I like raise an issue, and then... Well, and then, if you yeah, decide to be a big boy and take care yeah. of yourself, well, you'll last there for a while. Mm-hmm. I need context. Maybe. What is maybe? <laughs> what is maybe? I just know somebody's going to be like, oh, you think you're a smart kid. And I am. I have a degree in information systems. So if I see a way to improve something, I'm going to suggest it. And Why then you they're brought gonna, up this degree in information gonna, systems that no one cares? 
Caleb was kind of savage. savage. What did I do? Why what? Did I, why did? Why do I have a degree in information systems? If nobody cares. We don't. No, no. We then don't why care. Do I even have it? We don't. Should ca- I go back to Texas Tech and just give it back to my professors? So it's exciting yeah. to you, but Felt insulted. in the it's, real world, it, it actually does matter. Like I've accomplished a lot of things with it, but because mm. of the degree or because of yourself. Obviously, this guy, he, he went to Texas Tech, he got a good degree, and he was proud of it. But vocationally, if there are not jobs out there that will employ you with that degree, at some point, you got to figure something else out. you got to figure out how to figure out a way to move forward and not just keep waiting for something magical to happen. Over 70% of the general public works in a field outside of that's their right. degree. So, I mean, that's they might need to pivot to that. But the other thing I think about, I think about like doctors. Mm-hmm. I see so many doctors graduate from medical school. They're older, and they've been in college and school and, and, and for so many years. As soon as they get out, they think they need to be rewarded mm-hmm. because they've earned, they, they've, they've earned it. They've been sacrificed. You could sense that in this same individual. Is that, that he, he did a, a major that was hard, like information systems, mm-hmm. and he felt like, now I'm, I'm re- I should be rewarded. I'm entitled. And meanwhile, the market's not paying that yeah. forward. It's don't make those mistakes. Just because you have gone to college for years and you've earned this this reward of a degree, it doesn't mean anything owes you anything until the appropriate time. Remember, you have to live on less than you make to start the wealth building process. The world does not care what you put into it until you actually have the connection of somebody willing to pay you or you start an endeavor where you actually make more than what you're actually spending and and there's a big disconnect there. It is irresponsible of a parent to not be 100% set up for retirement if they have kids because then it forces them to be financially responsible for their parents. No kidding. Yes. I don't believe that. Because they're not going to allow their parents to just die on the street. What do you mean you don't believe that? I don't believe that. I don't don't believe that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say why. Oh, I I just, I don't, I don't believe that it's, I think that's parenting. If you grow up to tell your kid, you got to take care of me, you know, then yeah, your kid's going to feel guilted into taking care of you because they don't have that much money or your parents don't have that much money. But I never would tell my kid, like, it's your responsibility. No, 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 I'm not saying you're telling them, but I'm saying if you're not able to afford to retire because you never saved up any money to retire, which at this point, we're not saving up any money to retire, they are going to feel morally obligated to take care of you and put certain things of their life on hold because of that. No, I don't believe that. Okay, well, you could not believe it, but the the statistics would suggest otherwise. I mean, we have had this great, uh, I forget the name of the article, what it said is essentially we are living in this place where now, not because people are choosing to be multi-generational, not because people want to bring in their elderly parents, but it is now the default, the fail-safe, the parachute for parents that did not plan well or not having to move in with their kids. And I don't think no parent goes into retirement with that plan, but as my mom used to say to me, failing to plan is planning to fail. And when it comes to retirement, it's no different for parents. There's this weird codependence thing that's going on and the fact that a lot of younger people are are leaving the house much later. Mm -hmm. But then on the other side of it, you're starting to see where the, 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 the older boomers and others who are approaching retirement, they don't have any money saved up. So it's actually becoming quite normalized to move in with their adult children to the point that, and I've been talking about this for years, is, is the whole oxygen mask mm-hmm. on an airplane is you better make sure you take care of your finances before you help your children out. But there was actually, I think it was a New York Times article, I covered it in one of our shows, where now it's normalized. You had a smiling mom and her old, and her and adult, adult son, son, and they're like all proud, and it's all because mom is broke, mm-hmm. that she's got to move in with the son. And and look, that's very noble that the, the if you that the children are moving Moving in and so forth, but it ought to be a choice, an mm-hmm. option. So that you have decided that what's best for your growing family is an extended family experience where you're inviting relatives to move in, not because mom and dad can't afford to eat. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that that's just taking away options, is taking away the goodwill of the entire experience, and that's sad. We as parents often try to justify the things we do for our kids, saying, oh, I don't, I don't want to rob them of their childhood, or I want them to experience the things that I didn't experience. I want them to have the things that I did not have. But what you don't recognize is when you prioritize that over your own financial foundation, instead of robbing them of their childhood, you're robbing them of their adulthood. You're robbing their children, your grandchildren of their childhood because grandma and grandpa have to move in with them. So if you can put yourself on solid foundational financial footing, you're going to be much better positioned to help your kids both now as well 
as later in life. Why? Why are you overdrafted if you have forty five hundred dollars in the savings? Well, it's high. Yeah, pretty high. She doesn't want to spend the savings money. That doesn't make sense. You've lost seven hundred fifty dollars this year. Yeah. Wife, if you are watching this, please understand that makes (laughs) no mathematical sense. Seven hundred fifty bucks you've lost because you're not willing to transfer forty five hundred. Because immediately you don't have retracted. No. How old is she? Uh, we're same age, twenty seven. How old's your kid? Six months. Okay. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Twenty seven. Yeah. No retirement. Stacked in debt. Stacked in debt. Yeah. Riddled in debt. And no retirement. We congratu- everything else in here is literally just cards and crap, credit cards and debts. A, a little bit of stuff to unpack here. One, if you are someone who's getting hit with overdraft fees. That should not happen. One, you should have an emergency reserve, or at the very least, if you're following the financial order of operations, you ought to at least have your deductibles covered, $1,000, $1,500, $2,000 in an account. Well, nowadays, you can actually link that savings account to your checking account for automatic overdraft protection. So if you're getting hit with overdraft fees and you have cash on hand, you've just been lazy. That part's on you. Now we have his actual situation where 27 years old, Got a baby, six month old, no retirement savings, not saving for the future. I, I, I'm noticing a trend here. You know, when I, when we do our show content every year, and you, y'all make fun of me because I get so excited. The bank rate releases the percentage of Americans that can come up with a thousand dollars. Yep, and you can pretty much set your clock to around sixty percent. Sure. And I, I've often wondered, I'm like, who are these people that can come up with a thousand dollars? Caleb has gone and found them. He's found he's found, <laughs> and they're all willing to self confess on why they're absolutely horrible with money. I mean, this person can't come up with it. I mean, I guess they have 4500 he, He'd argue with me because he'd be like, I got $4,500 in the savings. Guy. No, you, you, you really, if you're running credit card debt at this level, that's well beyond the $4,500. You have overdraft of $70, $750. There is tremendous discipline issues here. It, it's all back to the point of if you can't live on less than you make, you're never going to get out of the starting block mm-hmm. of wealth building. Caleb, I appreciate you bringing light to some of these, like, uh, bad financial situations, and I'm hope I hope that through that people are able to recognize there's a better way to live. I don't have to rack up the credit card debt. I don't have to live paycheck to paycheck. I don't have to not have a future. I hope in what he's doing with these audits is educating these folks around because most of the folks he's talking to are still young folks. And the beautiful thing about young folks is that time is still on their side. There's time that they can right the ship, and I'm hoping. Caleb is a mechanism and a voice that allows him to do that. Well, I enjoyed this. I got to tell you, I'm probably now going to go check out more of Caleb's videos because I think he does a great job. I can tell he's a theater kid just like I was a theater kid. I just can sense it. But he also does a great job of taking it right up to the line of being kind of mean to these people, but that's what they need. They need some medicine. They need some some cold water thrown on the situation. But you can also sense there's a lot of empathy there as well. So, So keep on rocking on in the free world, Caleb. I think it's awesome. And um, I think you've picked up a new subscriber. We'll talk to you soon. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen, Money Guy Team.